Welcome to HEC TV's live interactive program that's part of St. Louis. The whole production is pulled together. It's going to be a steel bridge. The way the cockpit is designed. The highest rated green building in the world. Welcome to HEC TV Live. Hi everybody, I'm Tim Gore, your host for today's program. Today our focus is, it's good to be green, reduce, reuse, and recover. The video images you're seeing now, of course, are some images that many of you may be familiar with. They give us some demonstration of the amount of product that America creates that ends up hopefully being recycled. Of course, there's also a lot of other product in America that does not end up being recycled. We're going to have the chance today to talk about the importance of being green. And I'm very happy to welcome you to the library at Flynn Park Elementary School in University City. If you send us your email questions, send them to live at hectv.org. That's live at hectv.org. And you might have just heard that sound. That means I get a text message to indicate that, yes, indeed, we already have an email question that's come in. So you may hear that happen throughout the program so that Tim knows that email questions has come to him. As I mentioned, we're going to be talking about why it's good to be green, how you can think in terms of reusing products, how you can reduce the amount of waste you create, how you can recycle and recover. And to do that, we're being joined by three guests, and I give, I'm going to give them a chance now to introduce themselves a little bit. We're first First of all, I'm going to turn over to Bill Gunter from the Missouri Recycling Association. Give the students a little bit of information about you and your interest in this whole green movement. I worked for the Parkway School District here in St. Louis for 30 years. In the last 16 years of my career, I was very much involved in their waste recovery and recycling program. I was responsible for that fully for approximately eight years. Currently, I serve on the Missouri Recycling Association Board of Directors and their Vice President, which is an organization that helps promote any and all kinds of recycling throughout the state, provide educational opportunities, and works on legislative issues here in the state capitol. Very good. So you guys are interested in those kinds of topics. We want to talk about that. We're also being joined by Katie Mike Smeistrela from the Earthway Center of the Missouri Botanical Garden. Katie Mike, thanks for being with us. Hi there. I'm Katie Mike Smeistrela, and I work for the Missouri Botanical Garden, where I promote sustainability through environmental education and improving the built environment. So at the Earthway Center of uh, the Sustainability Division of the Garden, we actually are very interested in seeing schools go green, not just in the building itself, which is just as important in the practices they may be implementing, such as recycling or maybe even energy efficiency steps too, but we're also interested in greening the curriculum. So how can we tie this into the lessons what the students are studying? And we're joined also by Gary Gilliam from PE Resource Management. Gary, thanks for being here. Um, I, we're the nuts and bolts of the recycling. We're the ones that take the material that is intermixed as single stream recycling, using automated systems, uh, removing the material and making it into a marketable product. I uh, personally am the sales manager and uh, help to create the programming of uh, municipals and guide that material into our facility for uh, creating a marketable product. Well, thanks to each of you for being here. As you can tell, of course, uh, without a doubt, we've got a wide variety of expertise here. We're interested in you being able to get to that expertise by the questions that you ask. Don't forget, if you're joining us via internet or television, you can email us at live at hgctv.org. For interactive video conference schools, I'll be coming to you for questions throughout the program. So we know that some of you have done a little bit of waste audit yourself before this program started and we want to get some statistical data about that but i also want to just begin before we get to some specific examples with just a general idea what can you tell us bill about the amount of stuff that america produces are we talking huge numbers in terms of recyclable material yes it's a very large amount i can't give you a mm -hmm. tonnage factor but it's huge okay katie mike most definitely. Even if you're looking at how many milk cartons a school produces, that could be up to 75,000 a year. That's just in milk cartons. Think about everything else your school throws away. And Gary, from your perspective? Well, just uh, speaking from our one facility in Chicago, we, uh, we save about 4 million trees a, uh, a, a year. Mm. So it's uh, quite a, an opportunity to, uh, to be able to maintain and recover things that would have on there, would have been in the trash. Mm -hmm. So when we look at that kind of volume, 223,000 tons of paper a year saved by one one facility, it, it's a huge, uh, a huge uh, volume being created. It is, and, and interesting that you mentioned trees. I looked up some information uh, on the from the Clean Air Council, and they informed me that every American basically uses enough wood and paper products each year to equal one 100-foot Douglas fir tree. 
When you think about the amount of people in America then, 250 million or whatever we're up to now, you get an idea of how many 100-foot Douglas fir trees that is. They also let me know that the average American office worker, just in case you, your parents work in an office, uses about 500 disposable cups every year. And Americans throw away enough paper and plastic cups, forks, and spoons to circle the equator 300 times. There's lots of other numbers that we can talk about as we go through today's program, but talking about plastic and paper and all those kind of cool things, a school right here, Flint Park Elementary School, is doing something about it, and some of you have done something about it as well. So I want to go over now and meet the students who are making a difference here at Flint Park and let them talk a little bit about the project they're doing. So Cecilia and Ellis and Clint, if you guys just want to join me up here, come right on up. Ellis, you can p come over to my right side, and, and, and Cecilia, right over there next to Ellis, will be absolutely great. This is Clint Christensen, who's the sponsor of the Lions Club here in uh, Flint Park Elementary School. Many of you in here, Lions, may be thinking about a different organization. So let's talk a little bit about what Lions is and what it does. Absolutely. Lions, the acronym stands for Local Investigations of Natural Science. And basically, we are a, we're a club that is, was created by a grant through the National Science Foundation through the Missouri Botanical Garden. And we have received extensive support from both Earthway Center and the Litzinger Road Ecology Center. And the whole basis of the program is how can we get kids excited about math and science in an after-school program? But we want to make sure we do so in a way that's action-based and we get people motivated and have fun at the same time. And so I know you guys have been doing a product, project. Uh, we've been doing a waste audit in the building to find out what the, it's going on. And these students have been doing some cool things with it, right? Yes, they have. Ellis, you want to describe for our audience just in general what you guys have been doing the last week or so? Flint Park Lions collected the trash from all the lunch periods of being standard school day. Our school has four, 430 students. The waste audit is a part of a, of a larger waste assist, assessment, assessment. The waste audit gathered measurable data, while waste assessment evaluates how we consume materials and process the waste. We conducted staff interviews as a part of the waste assi assessment. So you had the chance not only to count trash yourself, but also to talk to people in the building about what they did in regard to the trash and waste that was created. And I know you guys came up with a lot of interesting numbers. So Ellis, I know you guys, first of all, looked at paper. So what's the amount of paper waste that you guys found this week? 15 pounds. 15 pounds of paper was your average for paper this week? Yes. Very cool. And Cecilia, I know you have some information about glass for us? Um, yes, there was no glass in our waste audit, but... Um, the students who were in charge of the glass did help with the other um, categories, like paper, metal, and plastic. And should we assume that the reason there's no glass in your waste audit is because you just uh, you guys don't use glass in like your cafeteria and stuff? You guys are using plastic cups? Yes. Okay, very cool. And Ellis, I know you have some information about metal. We collected at least one bucket of metal. The total weight was nine... No, well, not nine pounds, but um, point nine pounds. All of our metal was waste, was aluminum foil. At this weight, we throw away about four point five pounds a week. This is a about eighteen pounds or eighteen pounds a month, or two hundred sixteen pounds a year. Wow! All right, so we're talking about a lot of metal waste. And Cecilia, I know you did some things with plastic, which I assume you did have, unlike glass. Um, we collected three buckets of plastic. Um, the total weight of plastic was 9.4 pounds. Um, most of our plastic waste was fruit cups and eating utensils. Um, at this rate, we throw away 47 pounds of plastic a week. Um, this is about 188 pounds a month, or 2,000 256 pounds a year. Wow. That's a lot of plastic that you're doing. And you also looked at some organic stuff, right? Alice? Two bags and one bucket. One of the bags was placed in the dumpster during lunch. So we had to estimate its weight based on the weight of the remaining bag. We collected 54.5 pounds. Of organic material. Most of the organic was waste was peaches. Peaches. Oh, it's a peachy day right here at Flint Park Elementary. I'm sorry, I know it's bad people, but I just had to do it. And some, some additional information, Cecilia, about your organics? 
Um, we did find out a lot of what people don't like to eat. So now we we can, um, once we get the chance to interview the lunch ladies, we can say that they don't like this. So we can, um, we don't have to create so much waste. That's very good because why? Did people like the peaches? Aha, uh -huh. so that answers that question. Uh, we've got some great images of you guys doing this work that we want to we want to we want to show the audience now. We'll start with image ten, which gives the uh, gives the students gives everybody an idea about what it is you guys went through. And start it. That'll come up on the screen here in a moment as we go to picture ten. So here you guys are just the buckets of stuff that you're referring to here. And as we move through these images, we'll just go straight through to eleven and just continue to move them through eleven, twelve, and up. Uh, as we do this. In this picture, you're obviously looking at the waste and collecting it. And the number 11 is uh, you're counting stuff up now at this point. Did you guys, I guess, it looks like you guys have like sheets of paper. Was that so you guys could know the difference, with, like to mark plastic versus paper and that kind of thing? Yes. Very cool. And as we move on now to the next image, number 12, this is people getting into what I would call your hazmat suits. And the next picture, I know they are exactly hazmat suits. And Clint, talk a little bit about this. Um, I feel like we're, we're having a, a toxic moment. Uh, the reason was because they actually were going to get, get into the trash, right? Yeah, we, what we did was we collected um, food waste from one lunch period, and it was for all 430 students in the school. We separated it out. So first, the kids were responsible for helping kids separate trash within the cafeteria. And after that, after school, we separated it into the those categories they mentioned and within those categories then we had to weigh each bucket when it was filled and then um, record the data and wow. then we used that data we um, analyzed it and extrapolated it out into the numbers you heard so oh, very cool very cool so we want to make sure everybody got to see that picture for sure and then we go to the next image there we go right there in the middle of it a happy smiling Lions Club member nothing like it the wonderful world of waste uh, to make one's good afternoon happen. And in our next picture, we can see the whole group. And so we're talking Lions Club is about, what, 20 kids or even more? 24, 24 kids. 24 kids. Yep. And, and your elementary school is K through 5? K through 5, yes. The Lions, we are, they're fourth and fifth grade students. Very cool. Yeah. Clint, thanks very much. Absolutely, thank you. Alice, thank you, kind sir. Cecilia, thank you very much. I'll let you guys sit down. And I'm going to head back to the table while our student groups start to think in terms of questions they want to ask. Let's go to Geggy Elementary School in Eureka, Missouri. Geggy, if you're there, come in and say hi to everybody. What question do you guys have right now? Where does recycling go after you sort it? Oh, well, we're going to talk about that quite a bit, about where recycling goes after we sort it out. So don't lose that question, Geggy, because there's a lot of different ways we can talk about that. I'm going to write that down because we definitely want to do that. We've got some cool stuff to show you about where recycling goes. So, Geggy, thank you very much for that question. Let's go to Wiley Intermediate in Abilene, Texas. Wiley, come right on in and unmute your microphone. Do you guys have a question or comment now? What exactly can be recycled? Oh, what exactly gets recycled? Well, all sorts of things get recycled. So, Gary, I guess just in general, before we begin to talk about stuff that comes through your company that gets recycled. Basically, uh, when we start talking uh, of material, the answer is very simple. Any paper that you can tear that's not food or bodily waste contaminated can be recycled. Glass, plastic, aluminum, steel, all are very recyclable today in all markets. So about 80% of what comes through a home and even maybe more from a school system can be recycled. And that's waste diversion. Very cool. Very cool. And we're going to talk, we're going to see examples of how you can recycle. These guys have some great things we're going to look at for that. I also want to let everybody know that we heard the word from Ponder Elementary down in Texas. Ponder, thanks for joining us via view only video conference. Don't forget, guys, that if you've got questions, you can email them to us at live at hectv.org. I've gotten some text messages, so I'm going to go to email questions. But their average for trash this last week was 11 pounds was 11 pounds of trash. So we're talking about a lot of trash that's getting created. And Katie, Mike, to let you begin to talk a little bit about the need to recycling and what you um, see as we think about recycling and the economics of that, uh, the sustainability issue. Talk a little bit about what is sustainability, what we really mean by that word, and how do we make that part of our life? So sustainability, the definition, is meeting the needs of the current generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, students already know this. They learned this in probably even before kindergarten. It's sharing. 
right? Mm -hmm. Sharing with people you might not know, right? Because who knows their great, 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 great grandchildren. But um, they're probably going to come along. There probably will be humans in the future. So can we share our natural resources with these people? Of course we can. We've already learned how to do that. So we need to think about how we use those natural resources now. And that includes recycling. Very cool. Um, making sure we use those over and over again. Now, Bill, if I go to like a recycling center, like there's all sorts of them around the St. Louis area. I could just like drive up in Kirkwood, which is a local suburb and other places, and put my stuff there. Is that all like cities are spending their money? That's all government money? Is it, is it a private is it a combination of cities and private companies doing it? It could be any of the above. Okay. Uh, for example, where I live, we have uh, single stream recycling, which is funded through the residential fee for the recycling program. City of Kirkwood has a common area where any resident can come. Not e they don't even have to be a resident of Kirkwood and can drop off their materials. That's pretty much being funded through um, public dollars. So it depends on the situation, but it can be any or all of the above. Very cool. Thank you all. Let's start to talk about recycling. Let's get into the good stuff, so to speak. Let's get into the gunk and the junk and all those kinds of things. And Gary, we're going to start by giving the students a tour of your facility that we had the opportunity to go through. And I just want you to know that our producer, Jackie Poor, mentioned the fact that afterwards um, she will remember the tour quite uh, eventful in terms of like both the size and the scale and everything you had and that she just had no idea there was that much stuff that is going to be part of what you're dealing with. A absolutely. Education is is 90% of recycling. Uh, people, this, this is the uh, Kirkwood drop-off facility. We changed uh, resource management, changed Kirkwood's drop-off uh, recycling facility uh, into a single stream drop-off facility this year. Uh, this is a uh, showing trucks approaching and coming into our facility in Earth City. Uh, resource management operates three MRFs, which are recycling facilities. One in Chicago Ridge, uh, Chicago, uh, Illinois. Uh, one in Plainfield, and this is Earth City. And so Here's this this is all single stream, so I've got paper in there, I've got plastic in there, I've got aluminum in there, and all sorts of stuff together, right? Everything together. And it goes up this conveyor belt, and these gentlemen and ladies are responsible for separating it out? This is a pre-sort. This okay. is, you know, people are always afraid that they may make a mistake in the recycling. People, some people even uh, with, uh, withhold from recycling because of the fear of a mistake. We fix the mistake in our pre-sort. Uh, separate that material and prep it for uh, the screening uh, operation that is uh, fully automated. Uh, these gentlemen are now doing a quality check uh, of that material uh, after it passes through. And on a typical day, and you may or may not know this, but on a typical day, how much are you guys going through? We, we generally go through, at our facility, we go through about 250. Uh, we receive 350 tons on a day. We're actually increasing and doubling the size of our uh, facility as we speak, and in, within a couple of weeks, we'll be able to do about 500 tons on a daily basis. Um, currently, we're, we have to uh, take some of the pressure off this facility and go to Chicago. This is the bailing side. Of the, uh, of the operation. This is the reason, the, the sustainability reason. Our facilities have never received uh, or operated on tax dollars, federal, state, uh, or even uh, operation by grant funding. We, we, it's sustainable by marketable product. Uh, the ability to encourage people to bring that, uh, the, the waste industry, to the facility, weighing the material um, in and providing uh, an economic uh, value to that, uh, to, to those companies, uh, and uh, that's that's the encouragement that they receive to recycle uh, as as a company to bring the material uh, and the waste, uh, the the residential um, reason to recycle mm -hmm. is. So broad we could spend hours, but <laughs> economics and environmental uh, uh, reasons. Oh, very good. And we've got some video now, I understand, to show the students the, the comparison between all that paper, the bales of paper, and the amount of, of trees that are uh, saved uh, because of the, the, the work that is done there. So we'll bring that. So each bundle of recycled paper equals 13 trees. 13. And that bundle is how big? In that, that bundle is 1,500 pounds. Okay. Uh, for every ton of paper generated is 17 trees. That bundle okay. represented 13 trees in its, uh, uh, in its appearance. 
Each tree uh, provides, a 20-year-old mature tree, provides enough oxygen for two people to be mm. sustained, removing carbon dioxide as well. Wow. Let's go to Geggy Elementary School in, in Eureka. Geggy, do you guys have a question right now? Um, how often do you guys get, like, um, stuff that isn't supposed to be in your spot? How often do you end up with stuff going through that actually shouldn't have been there? Do you dump out a lot of stuff? Only about, uh, only about 5 6% residual coming out of, uh, of, of the recycling mm -hmm. stream uh, currently. Katie, Michael, I'll go to you guys for this one, for you to this one. Jana wants to know what happens to the lids of plastic bottles. We've got some examples here because these lids supposedly can't be recycled. Am I right about that? It depends, actually, and I think that's a better question for Gary, because okay. I'm sure he has a canned answer for that. Yeah. <laughs> a bottled answer. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's true. Um, if you leave the lid on the uh -huh. container, what happens is when it goes to the uh, uh, mill facility, the, uh -huh. the manufacturer, it's granulated into flakes. These flakes enter a water bath. The lids flow at a different level because of uh, float properties. Okay. And the lids may, most of the lids will become uh, a, a, a lumber type material, a lumber aggregate. Oh, wow. So Katie, Mike? Students may actually get to do some, a, an experiment that actually mimics how this works. So mm -hmm. students are learning about densities. Different plastics have different densities. So you could try this in your science lab, figure out which <laughs> Uh, numbered plastic mm -hmm. floats and which sinks. Oh. So as you might know, there are seven different types of uh -huh. plastic. So they all have a different density and they'll stay at different levels of that water. Oh, very cool. It also cool. shows Bill? how the industry has changed over the years because the bottle caps at one time were a concern. Now they're recoverable. Very so neat. as the in industry matures and technology improves, we can recover more and more. That's correct. This is an interesting question from Becky, and, and I'll stay with Bill, and then we just go back down, because it could be from anybody who could answer it. What do you guys consider the top item that actually is recyclable, but most people just don't know about it? You know, the one that would be like, oh my gosh, really? You're kidding me. What do you think, Bill? I'm going to say metals. Okay. Uh, just because of my own experience with working with the school district. And okay. The, the amount of material that can be recovered Metals never lose their value and should never be thrown away. Okay. Katie Monk? Oh, well, I'm still going to stick with the number one thing that people throw away, paper. It still blows everyone's mind how much is still getting thrown away, and we all know that paper can be recycled. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And anything different from you, Gary? I, I think the number one thing, it depends on programs throughout uh, yeah. the country. Mm -hmm. All programs or a lot of programs are different. But I think a septic packaging, like yeah. the little mm -hmm. cartons, uh, juice cartons, oh, yeah. the uh, gable tops, the... Uh -huh. Minute made, uh, yeah. the, you know, a lot of people look at those and, and they think, oh, this probably isn't, but yes, they are. In our program here in St. Louis, in the Midwest, uh, uh, septic packaging is a marketable product. Very cool. Katie, Mike? And I'd actually like to turn that over to the students because I think they noticed one of the biggest things they found in the uh -huh. waste audit was indeed milk cartons. Is that true? Cecilia, pop on over here for me, Cecilia. That's right, just walk right on over. It's okay. I've asked for you, so it won't be a problem whatsoever. So you obviously have to deal with a lot of milk cartons here at school, right? Mm -hmm. So they were, they were a lot of your waste? Yes, um, in our paper waste. In your paper waste. And so did you, so as you guys uh, looked at it, were you thinking, did it surprise you how many milk cartons there were? No, because I know a lot of people do drink milk here, so it didn't really surprise me for how many there were. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Cecilia. Going back to your milk carton, yeah, uh -huh. the number one uh, answer to recycling a milk carton is it must be empty. Ah, it should be that... it should be free of milk residue, and that makes it very recyclable. At that very point. cool. Um, basically, from plastic, uh -huh. everybody wonders what happens to this material once they put uh -huh. it in their bin and and make that what it's going to be made into. Uh, there's uh, the plastic bottle is not able to be refilled because FDA does not allow food grade product to go back okay. into that plastic. Uh, so our plastic is sent to a company that will take that plastic, make it into these flakes that we were talking about just a few minutes ago, make it into the flakes, then it goes into a water bath, cleans the flakes, goes into another part of the facility where it is made into something very unlikely for a water bottle or drink bottle. Uh -huh. It's made into a fiber that looks much like cotton. It has the properties and the feels of a polyester. Uh -huh. 
Uh, it can be made into clothes, sweaters. It can be made into uh, backpacks and many different things. But uh, uh, over 50% of the carpeting today made in the U.S. Uh -huh. is made from your drink bottles. Oh, wow. Very cool. So there you guys have an idea about that. A a and Katie, Mike, we've had an email question come in about curbside recycling because I know that's a big thing. So, like, if I've got a curbside recycling program, is it the company that takes that stuff to a facility to recycle it out? Or how, do, how does that, what happens at that point? Okay. Well, um, there's a hauler involved. First steps, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so a truck will come to your driveway, pick up that curbside bin, and then take it most likely to either a facility like Gary's, or maybe it'll make a pit stop on the way to combine multiple loads before they take it to a place like Gary's. And so the curbside collection most likely is single stream. It could also be dual stream, though, too. So it depends on where you're living. Okay. Um, and that makes a difference. And your curbside collection might also be different from what your school is collecting. So it's important to read and know the rules of the recycling program. So hopefully it'll be right there on your bin. But if not, look into it to make sure there's not a difference between your curbside and your schools. I remember growing up, and you'd buy soda pop. And for me, where I grew up, it was pop, not soda, whatever, uh, carbonated beverage. And you'd be able to take that, those pop bottles back to the grocery store, and you'd actually get money back for them. And we actually have an email question that comes to us from uh, Tony Central in New York State talking about a five-cent deposit that they have in all soda and other aluminum cans as well as on water bottles and stuff in their state. Where are we in Missouri with those kinds of deposit laws and, and those kinds of things? But you're talking about legislation. Um, Missouri currently does not have such a model bill. Um, and it will be uh, a significant challenge for us to have one uh, passed in Missouri. Um, the city of Columbia, Missouri, used to have one, and it was uh, repealed um, within the last five years. Um, so they now are back to single stream um, voluntary um, recycling on the uh, individual's part. So in Missouri, no, we don't have one. And I think California, Michigan, New York, Maine, a couple others probably do have them, but uh, that's the extent of it right now. I can offer some interjections. Uh huh, Gary. Uh, the reason that uh, City of Columbia had to re did reject their bottle bill was they started a curbside program to try to get the, the to every home. Mm -hmm. the 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 problem with the curbside was they were missing a, a very valuable asset. The reason that curbside works well is to have $1,800 a ton aluminum in, interjected in the single stream as well as four to $800 plastics. You remove that and you remove uh, the valuable, some of the most valuable properties from a ton of recycling. So in, uh, in, in essence, Columbia, to be able to reach farther into the mm -hmm. curbside recycling program, had to add value back in to operate a material recovery facility gotcha. or a work. We had an email question that just came in about recycling. Does it cost us more money or does it save us money in the long run? Katie, Mike, what would you say to that? Oh, I think it, the best it could be um, a money maker. Mm -hmm. Most times it ends up being net neutral if you've done something to reduce the number of trash pickups. So what isn't going into your uh, garbage, uh -huh. into your trash can now, um, will, will mean that your dumpster won't need to be emptied as often. So you could save money by uh, reducing the number of pickups you pay for trash, but then um, make money perhaps on the recycling, or at least balance the two off, depending on if you're collecting your own cans yourself and all of that. And I wanted to go back to that uh -huh. last question as well. The reason why a bottle bill works is that we start to see that glass bottle becoming valuable, mm -hmm. right? It has a, a mon monetary value now. And so we don't think of it as garbage. We think of it as money. Mm -hmm. So what if everything you were about to pitch, you thought of as having a dollar value? Because it does to Gary. Uh -huh. Yes, right. it does, obviously. Right. It does Absolutely. to Gary because that's how he's making his profit. And I remember that as a kid. I loved going right. back to the grocery store with my pop bottles because that 25 cents or whatever I was going to get back was going to become money. I was going to go down to the dime store or whatever. Absolutely. There, there were dime stores also, by the way, children at that point in time. I've got some interesting numbers, actually, that I looked at from the Clean Air Council that talked about the amount of money that we're actually able to make uh, in this country as a result of recycling. And I'm assuming, Gary, that you're, in, you're a for-profit operation. Absolutely. So, I mean, you obviously have realized that there's a market here, right? That's, that's true. That's right. And um, in 2008, the average amount of waste generated by each person in America per day was 4.5 pounds, in case you get, didn't know that. 1.1 pound of that was recycled. 0.4 pounds, including yard waste, was sent to composting. 
And Katie, Mike, I know we want to talk a little bit about composting as we look at recycling as well. And you've got some cool stuff to let's let's go to talk. Let's talk about food waste and composting. Okay, well, my first prop I'd like to show is actually mm -hmm. just a visual, right? So mm -hmm. the reason why there's money to be associated with it is because not only are we recycling, and that's what this logo means, that it the object is could be recyclable. That we also have to buy recycled mm -hmm. as well. So someone has to look at an object and see that, oh yes, it is made from recycled content, and that creates a market for Gary to sell to. And I think Bill might be able to talk about Missouri's Buy Recycled campaign a little bit more as well. But it's just as important, maybe when you're looking for school supplies, like your notebook, mm -hmm. that you're looking for this particular logo, which differs from your average recycling logo. Very good. So that's one prop. Bill, do you want to mention that right now? Well, well just since Katie just did. That a bit because that was on my mind earlier when Gary was talking. The way this, what drives this and what makes it work is that there's a market for mm -hmm. this material. It's a feedstock for something that's going to be consumed by a buyer. And so it's important for us as consumers to be looking at that label to see if it is made with all or partial recycled content because that's what's going to drive Gary's business and drive a successful recycling program. It's fine to divert it out of the landfill and save the landfill space, but then if you're not doing anything with it and you're not selling it as another product, then you haven't made any true inroads. Yeah, the, the Clean Air Council says it's an estimated that recycling, reuse, and composting create six to ten times as many jobs as waste incineration and landfills. And it makes a difference for city governments, Gary, I'm assuming? Because you're dealing with a lot of city governments, it, right? It does, and uh, it gives you a little bit of basis job-wise. Uh -huh. 16,000 jobs in the St. Louis area touch on recycling. Uh, $4.91 billion of revenue each year uh, generated through recycling efforts, uh, product uh, collected or, or, or purchased. Uh, as well as $650 million of, of uh, salary and payroll. Mm. So it does affect the economy, and there is payback. And, and from a municipal point, um, referring back to the value, uh, the, the, the value to the resident. A lot of people, I hear it all the time, what's in it for me? Mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, uh, about three, four years ago, the, the St. Louis County developed a program of districting and went out and did a bid for mm -hmm. recycling. The value after three years of the bids for their next trash five years mm -hmm. was lower ah. than it was three years ago. Matter of fact, oh, the wow. end, the five year uh -huh. end of that is, is actually lower than the third year of the first bid. Oh, so there is so money. There is return. Very it may cool. not be value, it may not be seen as a value as a, mm -hmm. A glass bottle right. or, or but there is return, return on the investment return. absolutely excellent katie mike let's continue okay all right so this is one of my favorite props this uh -huh. is actually from my own backyard and it's not quite finished yet but this is actually um my lunch and my dinner, most mostly dinners. But previous lunch and yes, dinner. Yes, previous. Oh well, uh, yes, right. I'm not eating it right now. <laughs> my previous pie. lunches mm -hmm. and dinners. So maybe things like pizza crust, because who doesn't like pizza? Mm -hmm. And what we're looking at actually is. Um, Feel free here to. Okay, is. Um, Finished compost. So this came from my compost pile. Uh -huh. And decomposers have done the hard work of converting that food waste into a product that can actually be used again, right? Another valuable product. And of course, in this case, we're looking at a, a soil amendment, right? Something that plants can really use. Very valuable to plants, mm -hmm. for sure. And if paper makes up the number one thing in our waste stream, and organics make up the number two, it might be something easy that all of us can do to reduce greenhouse glass gases is to just start a compost pile. Well, now let's talk about that a little bit, about how easy it is or isn't to do. Okay. Okay. Um, for example, I live in a loft apartment in a high-rise building in downtown St. Louis. And I used to live in a house which had a backyard and I had a garden. So I did compost for sure when I had my backyard and my garden and I used that compost. How easy is it for me to think about doing it if I'm living in th that apartment now. Does it work everywhere? It can. There are different <laughs> systems in place, and it depends on your ick factor. Okay. So if you're... I like that ick factor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're comfortable keeping a new pet, perhaps you could... Uh, have some worms uh -huh. as a pet that would actually eat your food waste. Now, obviously, worms are vegetarian. Mm -hmm. So if you're not vegetarian, that might be a problem. You okay. might still need to throw those pork chops away. But um, worms can actually compost a lot of those food scraps as well. 
And there are other composting methods as well, like uh, the Japanese use a technique called a bokashi bucket that ferments the food waste uh -huh. first. And um, that's definitely a space saver because not everybody does have that luxury of a nice big backyard, but oh, it very, can be done in urban settings. Very cool. We got an email question about, and I think this is excellent about being proactive because I know there are some local restaurants that definitely do this. How can one find out which restaurants, coffee shops, stores use recycling programs so that you can support them? Is there something Missouri Recycling Association does to let people know that kind of thing? There would be a list that would be available on the website, um, but I can't give you a specific restaurant or location right now but they, that can be accessed and a lot of them will self promote that as well True. Um, and there are a lot of restaurants in the st. Louis area that do practice um, uh, resource recovery or recycling and I think if you guys went to websites like sauce Sauce Magazine has a website for all sorts of local restaurants, and there's other restaurants. If you look up local, re local restaurants, you'll be able to find online, because I know the reason I know that local restaurants do it is because their websites tell me that. Um, and whoops, I love hearing that. Go right ahead. You bet, Katie Mike. Um, in addition to recycling, many, well, several restaurants here in Missouri are starting to also compost. Ah. So there is a transition there. Uh -huh. And also, I think that's innovative for the front runners of the restaurants that are starting to do that already. Mm -hmm. And I'm also seeing that from the school sector. There are some Ooh. schools that are starting to, just like they have a recycling bin outside uh -huh. the school, they also might have a composting bin, and a truck might come and empty that as well and take that away to be composted off-site. So oh, even if they don't cool. have the space, like we were talking about with your backyard, uh -huh. maybe they might still be able to compost those food scraps. And, and it becomes part of the economics of it. Uh -huh. As Katie said earlier, when you start looking at these resources differently, you can start to really minimize your trash hauling fees. Right. And right. you develop a product that you may be able to use internally that saves that business money up front because they're not going out and with compost, maybe not going out and buying mulch to mm -hmm. put around their trees because they've developed their own compost that they can use internally. Oh, very cool. I've been told that our interactive schools can't join us again audio-wise. I want to go to an email question from Geggy Elementary first, and then Geggy will go to you for a question, then we'll go to Wiley, and then we'll go to Mount Tabor. The email question is, what happens to the paper after it goes through the recycling pad and is put in that block? When the trucks take it out, where's it going? It, it can travel uh, in many directions. Domestically, uh, it, it can be uh, sent throughout the U.S. Uh, and remanufactured. Uh, paper can be recycled up to about 15 times. Okay. Uh, one of the things uh, that we refer to paper is we call it paper fiber. Okay. We're selling fiber. The longer the fiber, the more valuable the fiber. Office paper, longer, longer okay. fiber, higher value. Very good. It'll go to a mill, be remanufactured into many different things. It come back as, as uh, copy paper. If you buy right. copy paper and you see the contents, so on and so forth. Very but cool. It will be man remanufactured back into a paper product. Excellent. Geggy Elementary, a video conference question for you. Unmute your microphone, come in and ask. What is the most common item that is recycled that shouldn't be? Oh, <laughs> The most common item that's recycled that shouldn't be, that ends up in, 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 in where you don't want it to go. Uh, Gary, is there, from your experience? Uh, it is. Uh, the uh, remote control. Uh, the remote control. That's, that's the most It just obvious. ends up in people's trash all over uh, the place. People are reading their paper. If they're like me, we're watching the, the ball uh -huh. game. And, and we change the channel because we see something happen we didn't <laughs> like. And then we go back to it and we lay a remote down. Oh, wow. And, Lay another paper on top and very cool. It disappears. Thanks for that question, Geggy. I would never have guessed remote control. That's a great question to give us a segue into our next topic, which is all about what we can do. We've talked a lot about what we can do already, but there may be some other things that you can do that are fascinating and different than you expected. And uh, Katie Mice got some examples of that we're going to look at in a minute. But I first of all want to be able to go to Flint Park Elementary so they can tell us what they're going to do with their information. So I'll get up now and meet Cecilia and Alice again. Come on up, guys. Because if I'm correct, you guys are going to take this waste audit information you've had, right, and now something's going to happen with it. Right, Alice? What's the next step? Um, we're going to keep on recycling, and we're going to try to find more stuff. So you're going to try to recycle even more, and are you doing something school-wide to, like, help people understand the importance about recycling? Um, well, we are helping the children sort the food, put their um, utensils and milk cartons in one trash can, and their... Um, food and the other. So we are helping. Great. So you're going to help them sort their stuff out so that you end up being able to do a better job of recycling yourself. Now, Cecilia, why does this matter to you? I'm a 
earthy person, I guess. Um, I think it's fun to do things like this. Um, I think it's important. Cool. And Ellis, why do you think it's an important thing to do? Because we can help out, and then we can also have a clean community. Very cool. Thank you both very much. I'll let you guys sit right back down again. Now, don't forget, guys, if you guys have a question, you can just raise your hand, and I'll happily you know, bring you over to the microphone so you guys can ask a question, too. But we're talking about all sorts of cool things that are happening. And, and uh, Katie, Mike, when we talk about recycling and things that people can do, we've done some large-scale stuff. We've talked about a company that's doing a lot of large-scale stuff. We've talked about individual composting things. Most people are probably aware of, of newspaper recycling and those kinds of things. They think about it goes off somewhere. But there's lots of other interesting things they can do, right? Right, most definitely. So a few other props. Mm -hmm. So if we're I want to get back to Bill's point you about bet. reduce. So you might have been asked before, plastic or paper, well, we all know it. if we're reducing, a better option might be to bring your own bag, right? So there's an easy thing um, that's so common. And if the students themselves aren't actually doing the shopping, who do you think can bug mom and dad to bring these or make sure they're kept in the car? I can't overemphasize the kept in the car moment because I had my bags and I had, you know, the very, I was very proud of my bag that I'd gotten that said I used to be plastic bottles and now I'm, I'm a recyclable shopping bag. And I would realize I'd get to the grocery store and I would have left it at home. So my bags are all now in my trunk of my car. Right. And if that way, when I get into the grocery store and I'm shopping, I go, oh my gosh, I've left my bags in the car. At least all I have to do is leave the shopping cart in the aisle and go to the car and get it. So I... So I highly recommend that strategy. What else can so you like? Reduce, definitely. That's very easy. But let's talk about reuse, mm -hmm. too. Um, I think there are some easy things we can do for that as well. So back to those milk cartons, right? Mm -hmm. So here I have an example of a student where they have turned their milk carton into a little snack box, Ooh. right? So it's just a simple piece of Velcro there that they you know, can put their carrots or mm -hmm. what have you in, into here. And, and it's almost a... a a new Tupperware container. And here's oh. another one they made out of a larger plastic milk container. Uh -huh. Just a, a simple few cuts and a piece of Velcro. And then you have a built-in snack box that you can reuse over and over again instead of those darn Ziploc bags. Very nice. And I, I, I definitely nice cool. the artwork. Oh, most definitely. <laughs> well, um, if we're starting to get really creative with oh, some yes. ideas, um, I have, this was made by a um, high school student, actually, where she crocheted plastic bags into say. a hat. Uh, very, <laughs> nice. very nice. Obviously, she has a bit more crochet very. talent than right. I do, but that's very cool, right. actually. So, quite possible to think beyond. Yes, yes. Right? Well, and here's something that um, actually might have seen before, where, um, speaking of sewing, uh -huh that I have some students I've worked with in the past oh, that have like made a, a little pencil pouch, but this one was not made by a student. This was made by a company called TerraCycle, where schools can actually collect Capri Sun or, or um, whatever the drink pouch uh -huh. might be. They can also collect other things like Ziploc bags, right. writing utensils, uh, gum wrappers, candy bar wrappers, uh -huh. granola bar wrappers, and send it to this company, and this company will make it into something kind of kind of groovy, too. So As we continue to talk about these, I've got some email questions that, that, that come and relate to what we're talking about. The first one from Josh. Does composting attract rodents? Sometimes. Okay. <laughs> and honest, are there things I can uh, do about that? Well, um, if you're thinking about it, though, we're uh -huh. talking about recycling nutrients here. Right. So that's why you eat the food in the first place. Right. It, it gives you something for your body that you're using. So that's why the, the rat or mouse mm -hmm. might eat it, too. And whatever that n rat or mouse or raccoon is going to do with it, eventually they're going to process it, too. Okay. I know I know. we're talking about right? the P word here. <laughs> yeah. But uh, on TV, too. It's all right. But it's better that that nutrient get recycled into the natural Correct. cycle as opposed to get put into a landfill where okay. we're never going to be able to use that nutrient again. No, no plants will grow from that nutrient in a landfill. And Gary, Greg wants to know uh, from Geggy Elementary School, Bob and Greg, are you noticing any change in landfills? Are they getting less trash because of recycling? Are landfills actually filling up less rapidly than they used to be, or do you notice a difference? Absolutely, because okay. the movement is not just affecting the resident uh -huh. or, or, or us. It's also affecting the industry as well. Uh, the core business back uh, for the waste industry yeah. was landfill, the new the new revised version of the industry is recycling. Okay. Uh, the, and again, it's sustainability and it's the dollars. 
Mm. And Bill, we had an email question, and you can speak to this as well as you answer this one, about electronics. Uh, a tech coordinator in a district is interested in knowing why is it so hard to get rid of them? Or how can we make it easier? What is it about electronics and recycling? It's not that difficult okay. to recover the electronics. That's going to depend on the region and what the infrastructure uh, is available. Um, there's also some product stewardship legislation that's been passed in different states where whoever is the manufacturer of that item has to provide a way for that item to be recovered. Okay. So it depends on what you have in your area. And for the St. Louis area, we have a number of companies that recover these items, and it is not difficult. And it is another accelerating market out there because when you take apart a piece of electronics, it's plastic and it's metal, mm -hmm. both of which have um, quite a bit of value. We really appreciate the email questions we've gotten in, folks. You may have more. Just send them to us at live at HECTV.org because I could ask them of our guests in between our programs. We're back here again in the afternoon, and we'll be happy to email you responses. We've just got about five minutes left, so I'm going to let each of you do a little bit of summary and share some things you haven't had a chance to talk about. And by golly, I want to see some artwork as we do that because that right. thing is just too cool. So, Bill, as you think about the, the idea that we're after here, kids understanding why it's good to be green and what they can, you know, how they can be proactive, What's some words you'd want to leave them with? Some, what's some important points maybe we didn't cover that you'd like to mention? Well, I think we've covered a lot of the, the major points. The, Katie just handed me a flyer that I'd like to share with the group, and that is on November 15th, this is going to be uh, America Recycles Day across the country. And you have a grand opportunity to educate your students, your staff, on what the opportunities are out there for diverting resources from the landfill into uh, a, a different stream where they can be recovered and reused. Very cool. Katie, Mike? All right. Well, uh -huh. creativity abounds in students. I know this for a fact, and I've seen their doodles on their homework <laughs> to prove that. And I think we can think differently about our resources, whether it be a plastic bag like this chicken is made out of, it could, or this hat. Um, we can realize that these materials that were headed to the landfill can actually be remade into new products, and we individually have the ability to do something about that by simply putting it into the correct bin, whether it's a blue bin, like a recycling bin. I don't know what color your recycling bins might be at home, but by putting it into that recycling bin, it makes a difference. Very cool. And Gary? I'd like to insert a word called equity. Uh-huh. Recycling equity. We understand a lot of the environmental values, but the recycling equity. We've already mined, we've already paid to refine, we've already... And the word equity, in case the kids don't know it, by equity you mean? I mean your piggy bank. Mm -hmm. Savings. If you put nothing in, there's nothing to take out. We've already mined our bauxite out of the U.S., and it's all imported today. Just that we use for oil. aluminum. For aluminum, that's, that's correct. Uh, uh, starting uh, January 1st, the city of Kirkwood uh, started a curbside program uh, did a summary just recently where over the six months they averaged 43% in waste diversion. Mm. Moving it from trash to recycling, they diverted also a cost. $87,000 they would have paid at the landfill did not have to leave in, <laughs> to be paid. But I also paid, we also paid them over $120,000 for their trash. Uh huh. Not trash any longer. Right. right. It's, it's equity. equity. It's product. Recyclable <laughs> equity. And that is the same for these children, these young people. I, I shouldn't call them children. The young people. Mm -hmm. Because they have a piggy bank. And guess what? Right now, we seem to be in charge of it. Uh -huh. And we're doing a pretty bad job, or have been over the years. It's time for me as a grandpa to be uh -huh. better at providing future equity and and product stewardship of, of uh, resources uh, to be uh, managed. Uh, of course, the name resource right. management is the name of our company, and we're trying to do a better job at managing your resources for your future. And you guys are doing a great job yourself because you're taking steps. We really appreciate the fact that you shared with us this thing, and Ellis and all your Lions Club member, and Mr. Christensen, the sponsor of that club. Thank you for joining us. And to everybody at Flynn Park Elementary in the U-City School District, thank you for giving us this location to do the program from. We know that many of you may have more questions that you want to send us via email. Don't forget, it's live at hectv.org. And somebody just sent us an email speaking about electronics recycling. Let us know that U-City is having an electronics recycling day at Heman Park just this Saturday.
So talk about a well-timed uh, email. Yeah, Thanks very much for that. I, I want to thank Bill and Katie, Mike, and Gary for joining us. It's been a great conversation. And we could obviously spend a lot of time talking about any number of things about how it's good to be green. Hopefully, we've given you some things that will really make a difference in your life and you begin to think what it is you can do individually to make a difference. Then who can you talk to about making a difference yourself? Do, can you do curbside? recycling in your place? Do you need to actually go to the recycling center? What can your school do? See what those Flynn Park kids did and see how you can help your cafeteria staff make a difference with your school lunches too. Thanks very much for being here. It's always great to be part of HEC TV Live. This afternoon we'll be back at Flynn Park and then in December we're talking about the science behind earthquakes uh, and we're also doing a Pearl Harbor show on the 70th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Thanks everybody.